Sunday, Good Friday, now getting ready to celebrate Pentecost Sunday in 50 days. Uh, wherever you are right now, just open your mouth and give God glory for a few moments. We love you. We bless you. We honor you. We give you name praise. We thank you for being God. We thank you for being a way maker. We thank you for being a provider. We thank you for being a keeper. We thank you for being everything that we need to be. We thank you for being awesome. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for protecting us even more this time during this pandemic. We thank you for all that you're doing for us. We thank you for your hedge of protection. Hallelujah. We thank you for your angels of protection. We honor your name. We give you praise. We give you glory. Come on, wherever you are, just open your mouth for a few moments. Give them praise. We get ready for worship for a few minutes. And then we're going to jump right into the word. Right before we are, I need you to open your mouth and give them glory. Give them honor. We love you, Father. Hallelujah. We love you. We honor your name. Thank you for being so great. Thank you for being so awesome. There's nobody like you. Hallelujah. We lift our hands. We open up our mouths. And we give you praise. All glory and honor belongs to you. Hallelujah. All glory and honor belongs to you. No one else gets the glory. You get the glory. You get the praise. And we love you. We love you. We give you praise. We honor you. Hallelujah. We love you. Come on, wherever you at, I dare you to clap your hands and give him glory.
life streaming, that you'll transcend through the waves and go into the houses, go into the bedrooms, go into the living rooms, even go be someone at work, they may be watching from work, wherever they are, God, set free right where they are, God. We either speak now over this pandemic that is crossed and going across this world, COVID-19, the coronavirus, God, and right now we dispatch angels with swords dipped in blood to cover us now. Cover your people. Cover your people in the name of Jesus. Let no harm come nigh our dwelling. Let no danger come nigh our dwelling. Let no sickness come nigh our dwelling in the name of Jesus. And we believe it to be so. We'll give your name all the glory. We'll give your name all the honor. And once we come through this, because that's what we're doing, we're going through to the other side. We know that the report of the other side shall be victory. We will repeat death now in the name of the Lord Jesus. We cancel death assignments now. We declare that they shall live. We cancel death now in the name of the Lord Jesus. We rebuke the death angel now. Hallelujah. We plead the blood over our families. We plead the blood over our children. We plead the blood over our hearts. We plead the blood over our uncles. We plead the blood over our parents. Hallelujah, in the name of Jesus. Now go before us. Stand with us and stand by us. Now go we'll give the name all the glory, all the honor, all the praise that is due in Jesus' name. Anything that we ever really expected to see. 
and not even from this time last year or this time six months ago or not even three months ago, but just this time five weeks ago. I believe that many of us can probably say we never saw life coming to a screeching halt. Uh, in this moment, we are uh, in a place where everywhere we look, we seem to see nothing but hopelessness and bad news. On TV, it's bad press. On social media, there's so much bad news. When we look even at the economy, there's constant bad news. There are layoffs and debts that are accruing and sickness and disease, hospitals that are closed off to those who may have need but may not be considered a priority. There are workers on the front line sacrificing their lives each and every day, loved ones who have been emotionally violated by the idea that they cannot properly bid farewell to their loved ones due to the impact of the pandemic. There are mass graves that have been built to handle the numbers of deaths and still no assurance of when life will return to normal. Everywhere it is that we look, I believe that we see devastation. And uh, the thing that I have found is that these two components have the tendency to cause friction within the faith of the believer because we can't help but see uh, what is going on around us. We can't avoid it. It's like we can't get rid of it. We can't go around it. And globally, we are experiencing devastation. Everywhere we look, devastation. And I believe that it is a place where the enemy wants to cause us to become confused and frustrated in our faith. I believe that it is, in fact, the hope of the enemy that we get hung up in the fact that all we see is devastation. There's no light in this. There seems to be no hope in this because even if this has not directly impacted your life, I believe that the nature of humankind cannot ignore the impact that this has on the world at large. Sight is our ability to see a thing. While devastation is overwhelming, shock or grief, the two terms both have a tendency to be deceptive in nature and can cause friction in our faith because sometimes the devastation we see in the moment can cause us to forget what we know about God based on who God is and what God has said. And what I have found is that too many of us are about to miss this moment to trust God and see him make good on his word because we are distracted by the devastation that we see right now. But can I pause parenthetically here to tell you that distractions are a spirit of the enemy. Yeah, the devil, he wants to see you distracted by the devastation. He's working overtime to make sure that you overlook the fact that you serve a God who can take any devastation and cause it to work out for your good. And tonight, wherever you are all across the airways, I came to kill a demon and bind the spirit of distraction that has blindsided the people of God from remembering who we serve and standing on our faith in him that he is more than able to do exceeding and abundantly in our lives. Can I tell you that I have made up in my mind that I refuse to let the workings of the enemy make me forget that God's word is still relevant even in dark seasons. And this is the trouble of where we are in this current moment. Too many of us are dealing with the demon of doubt because we see devastation and the devastation makes us miss the details. And that, my brother and sisters, is exactly what is happening with Thomas in this very text. He is so overwhelmed with what he saw. And can I be honest enough to admit, I understand exactly where he's coming from. I get his doubt. I understand what it's like to wonder how God could possibly be in this. I know know what it is to wonder, has God taken his hands off of us? I know what it is to be so overwhelmed by darkness that you begin to question the relevance of God's word in this season because you've never seen this before. And that, my brothers and sisters, is exactly where Thomas is when we find him in this text. We find that Thomas, who sees the devastation in the aftermath of the crucifixion of his teacher, his master, 
his Savior, the one whom he has followed. For Thomas is one of the 12 disciples who have walked with him. He, based on relationship alone, should know him so intimately that doubt was never an option. He has followed Jesus, y'all. He has watched him perform miracle after miracle. He has seen him be a man of his word. Yet, when Thomas sees the impact of the crucifixion, his vision becomes impacted because he is witnessing now a time period in which now he is living without the physical presence of his hope. Can I help you to understand that Jesus has died on the cross? It wasn't until three days later that he would in fact rise again. The disciples see him. Thomas is not there. Eight days have gone by and we have this encounter. He is living in a period without his hope. The one that he is familiar with and I can only imagine what the world looks like to him not living with his hope. I can only imagine what it is to see a day and time where you don't have a hope to lean to. I can only imagine that he is feeling devastation on every leaning side, living in a world without hope. And what I have found about living in a world without hope is that living in a world without hope can obscure your view and your faith in God's ability to deliver you out of it. But y'all, can I help you understand that Thomas with the understanding that he feels this for a first time in a long time in a world without the peace of Jesus. He is seeing a world that is absent of his Savior. Others have seen him, but Thomas who wasn't present wasn't buying the idea of the resurrection because Thomas has now seen too many days without his hope. And I believe there's somebody on this live tonight that say, preacher, I'm trying to have faith. I'm trying to hold on. I'm trying to believe, but I have seen one too many days this morning without my hope. Y'all, they come to Thomas and they tell him, listen, we have seen the Lord. I know there's somebody that's been calling you, somebody that's been trying to encourage you to tell you that God has not found himself far from this. They come to Thomas. They say, listen, we have seen the Lord. Thomas uh, must be thinking, I know what you saw, but I also know what I saw because his response is this, that unless I see him for myself until I can put my hand hands in the print of the place where the nails was, where I can put my hands in his side. That is the only way for me to believe. And I believe that there is somebody tonight who knows what it's like to be living without your hope. In fact, in this moment, you may very well be feeling very hopeless about your life and about where we are in this current crisis. You may, in fact, be saying, preacher, you don't know what it is that I see. Every morning I wake up and I I see more days when I feel like there is no help for this. You just don't know what it is that I see. You don't know what it feels like to be laid off. You don't know what it feels like to try to figure out how to put food on your table. You just don't know what it is that I see. You don't understand what it's like to be diagnosed with this terminal disease or to have a loved one who has been taken out by this disease. You may very well be saying, preacher, I know what it is that you believe, but you just don't know what I see. And y'all, can I help you to understand like Thomas? Maybe your faith is in a place where the only way for you to believe is to find proof that Jesus is still in this. And can I tell you, you're not wrong. I get it. I understand it. I feel you. I know where you're coming from. I won't take that away from you. But when I found myself in the same space, I felt the conviction of God hit me because I got so caught up in what I saw. But the problem that I have is this. The place where I want to argue tonight and I pray to rebuild your faith is in the idea of this. That while I understand Thomas had every reason to feel the distinction of this devastation. While I know that he had every right to feel what he's going through, while I believe that you have every right to be furiated, frustrated, and confused about this moment, the issue that I have, the place that I want to encourage you tonight is to understand that Jesus, I know that he loves to deal with our doubts. I believe that he came to save the unbeliever. I know that Jesus doesn't mind meeting the mystery of the skeptic. Jesus actually invites 
Thomas to come and to feel the place where he was pierced. While I know that Jesus doesn't mind answering the call of the skeptic, tonight my appeal goes out to those whose current sight has caused you to forget what it is that he said. Uh -huh. Because while I know that it is hard for Thomas to come to grips uh, with this new reality, I can't move beyond the fact that Thomas heard Jesus say that this would happen and he still couldn't settle with it. Yeah, I cannot move beyond the fact that Jesus tells him that this would happen and he still could not believe it. Jesus actually spoke it in his presence and he still could not settle on it. I cannot move beyond the fact that Thomas heard these very words come out of the mouth of his Savior, but he still couldn't believe. Y'all, if you don't believe me, let's venture into the gospel perspectives. When we see Jesus, he had given the disciples a position at a point of understanding that they would soon see that what they are seeing right now is actually going to happen. For Matthew's gospel records in chapter 16, verse number 21, declares this, that from the time that Jesus began to show his disciples, and I love the Amplified Version because it says clearly that he must go to Jerusalem and endure many things at the hand of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, at the high court that he would be killed and raised from the dead on the third day. Go now to chapter 17 verse 22 through 23 it says that Jesus now declares when they were gathering together in Galilee Jesus said to them the son of man is going to be betrayed and handed over to the men who are his enemies and they will kill him and he will be raised from death to life from death to life from death to life on the third day and they were greatly deep um, they were greatly distressed and they were grieved. But Jesus said in Mark's gospel, chapter 8, verse 31, records this, that he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed, and after three days he would rise again. Yo, Thomas is no stranger to the words of Jesus Christ. He followed him. He was present during much of this. Jesus has not left them without an understanding that this may will be present, but so will deliverance through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And can I tell you that the problem that I have with Thomas in this text is like many of us, there are too many people that know him, but rather we forget what it is that he said because we're always responding to what we see. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that you have spent too much time caught up on what it is that you see. I know what it looks like. I know what it feels like. I know what's all around us. But what has he said? I want to suggest to the people of God tonight that this is not the time to be caught up on what it is that you see, but rather caught up on what it is that you know. And if you know anything about the God that we serve, you know that he is more than able to do exceeding and abundantly above everything that I can even ask, think, or imagine. I know what it looks like, but can you tell me what it is that he said? Y'all, Jesus leaves them with an understanding that it will get dark. He says to them, death is going to come. Hopelessness is going to come. Weariness is going to come. But he says, I will get up on the third day. I will be restored from death to life. Yet Thomas, who knows him, still doubts him. And tonight my appeal goes out to those who have walked with him, who have stood by him, who have followed him, who have believed in him, to stop letting your faith in him cause you to find yourself in a place where you doubt him because of what you see. For now, faith is the substance of things that is hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I want to suggest to you, my brother, my sister, that we don't have time for doubters. There are too many people who need God right now for those of us who know him to doubt him. We don't have time to be caught up on what it looks like around us because the harvest is still plenteous. And tonight, my challenge to the church of the living God is that if you say that you know him this is your time to show the world and trust him. I have made up in my mind that when we're in the midst of what's going on right now that I will not complain about anything but every day I will confess that God is still 
in the midst of this. Y'all, what I want to suggest to you tonight is that the darkness of his story does not discredit the victory thereafter, meaning every part of what God says concerning us is relevant to us in both the good times and the bad times. That's why I love the writer who said it this way, that I will trust in the Lord at all times, yeah, that I'll put my faith in him. This is the time that those of us who know him got to learn how to trust him in the darkness and in the deliverance, in the darkness and in the light, because the truth of the matter is everything he said in the dark is still relevant in the light. I wish you would encourage yourself to know tonight that his whole word is relevant to you, that we can't get so caught up in the day that we miss the fact that there is a plan that God has in all of this, that one day we will see victory over what we're facing right now. For to everything there is a season and a purpose under the heavens. And tonight I come to let you know that you cannot get so stuck in the fact that there is a time to tear down. That you not hold on to watch the miracle of what God wants you to build. You can't get so stuck in the fact that there is a time to weep. That you don't hang on until you see what God's going to do to make you laugh. You can't get so stuck in the fact that there is a time to mourn, that you miss the fact that God one day is going to give you a reason to dance again. Thomas, you can't get so stuck in the fact that there was a crucifixion, but you got to hold on to celebrate the victory of the resurrection. All I'm trying to tell you is don't get stuck in what you see. I don't know who I'm talking to or where you are tonight, but I wish you would tag somebody on this live or encourage your own self and declare I will not get stuck over what I see. I refuse to let the enemy cause me to be crippled because of what's in my view. But I believe that there's still victory in my hands even when there's devastation in my view. I believe there's still victory in my feet. Hallelujah. When there's devastation in my view. I believe God still got victory for my life even though there's devastation in my view. And I don't know who you are tonight or where you find yourself, but I wish you would take somebody on this line and tell them don't get stuck in what it is that you see. All I've come to suggest to you tonight is that you cannot get stuck right here because greater is coming after this. I decree and declare over you wherever you are that greater is coming after this, that there will be glory You gotta understand that there are elements of God's word that reveal his sovereignty. That sometimes, even though he doesn't say it directly, there are elements of his word that will reveal his sovereignty that gives us an understanding that we can hold on to. And so the question I'm raising tonight is what did he say? Y'all, when we look at the scripture. And we look at what Jesus left the disciples. He gave to them a confession. And in the midst of his confession, he reveals to us his sovereignty. Firstly, Jesus says to them, he says himself, the one who was scheduled to die, he told them this thing. The one who was facing crucifixion, he told them this thing. The one who knew he was about to die, he was the one to tell them. He told him it was going to happen. Can I tell you the element of his sovereignty that Jesus reveals when he tells the disciples that this is going to happen. Y'all, he shows us that he knows. I wish you would comment on this line and tell somebody around you. Tell them Jesus knows. Y'all, he's the one that's telling them that the crucifixion is coming. He's the one that told them that he would surely die. He's the one that told them that he would rise up again. And so what that tells me is that Jesus knows. 
knows. Understand that Jesus telling him means that he is knowing of what shall come. Jesus knowing means that he is aware. Meaning through the difficult season, Jesus tells us that he has control over this. That this has not caught him by surprise. That he's aware of the situation. And can I tell you that this might seem very minute to some of you in a day and a time where a whole lot of people don't know a whole lot of stuff. I'm glad to report tonight that Jesus still knows in a day and a time where the government doesn't know. Thank you. 
years, but then he shows us that there will be victories after this, that there will be glory after this, and wherever you are, and whatever you're going through, I dare you confess that there will be glory after this. He reminds us that trouble doesn't last always. He reminds us